Hey Todd, how are you? Hey, good, how are you doing? Yeah, pretty good, man. Good. Good, to, good to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you. And whereabouts are you at the moment? Um, like sunny you're, Carlsbad, you're, you're... California, finally. We've had, a, we'd have, we've had a rough go over here on the West Coast as of late, so. Yeah, um, there's so been crazy so... storms I've heard about. Yeah, yeah, we're not, you know, I think Southern California doesn't, isn't prepared for much rain. I always joke it gets below 55 degrees and everyone's got their down jackets on and they're all bundled up. So yeah, we're, we're ready for the sun to come back. Nice. And um, yeah, how's everything been going with the company? I think it's been going really good. You know, we, um, you know, we're, we're just over a, a, our year anniversary and, um, gaining a lot of traction and a lot of momentum. And, you know, as, as with any new business, especially targeting um, a new industry, it, it takes some education and, and time and, uh, but, but we're getting there. It's, it's really exciting and um, things are looking, looking really good for the future here. Yeah. Nice. And I'd love to get a bit of the backstory if that's okay. Uh, and your experience within marketing, within action sports, and yeah, kind of how it all started before before GoPro, and yeah, what, yeah, what was the kind of journey. Yeah, you know, it. Um, I, I'll I'll spare you too much detail, but you know, I've as a kid, I've always been entrepreneurial and um, always gravitated to things I was passionate about and enjoyed. And obviously, growing up in Southern California, um, action sports is just part of culture. Um, so I was fortunate to. Uh, make good friends with and, and, and work with and for um, amazing people within the action sports world and early days with Osiris Shoes and had an early mail order company and um, ultimately led to me starting an agency just because as we saw the growth of, of action sports and really corporate America wanting to target those audiences, there seemed to be needs for, for people and agencies to help bring those two worlds together. And um, it was, it was a, a good time when I started next agency and did that for almost 10 years, uh, and worked with tons of brands in and around the, uh, action sports industry and mm -hmm. car manufacturers and, and, um, NASCAR teams and supercross racers and did a little bit of everything. And during that time is when I, I met Nick Woodman at a, at outdoor retailer of all things. And, and. But he, you know, it was it was funny because I, I stumbled upon his booth and it was a 10 by 20 booth, like in the new new company section of the show. Um, and I remember watching him and he had this camera on his wrist and a camera on his head, and camera on his chest. And he's running around. And I was like, what is this guy? This guy's out of his mind. Right. And and uh, but he was in fact, he was making him himself was as well, wasn't he? There was all kind of. Yeah, this was Pat oh, that's post awesome. rubber band phase. So they were okay. there were 35 millimeter cameras. This was pre digital, and uh, he um, I think they had they had 35 millimeter at the show. They were talking about they had some prototypes for the first uh, digital camera, and I I obviously had an agency and and always looking for new clients. And I picked up a conversation with him just because of how energetic and passionate he was about what he was doing and. Like I said, it was, it was very infectious, and we just kind of started riffing on all these different applications that we saw for for the cameras. And really, he was surfing and and motorsports because he, of course, he surfed, and that was kind of the the you know the impetus for building a GoPro. But also, he he raced cars and he would put them on the roll bars. And when uh, we we sparked up a, a relationship, and he ended up hiring my agency to handle a lot of the early brand work and some of the first athlete sponsorships and team sponsorships. And we built the first website and did a lot of the endemic PR and, and, and really trying to get the brand in, into hands of athletes and, and people. And ultimately it led to a full-time position um, after, after um, selling off my agency and um, GoPro was just starting to hit that hockey stick and they just come out with the first, uh, HD camera and, and Nick asked me to come in really just to help build some formality around, uh, sports marketing. And it was everything from budgets to contracts to how do we segment audiences and how do we talk to skateboarders versus how do we talk to surfers and how do we talk to mountain bikers. And it was really important to build those authentic relationships with, with each one of those groups, which can sometimes be hard to do. 
Um, so that was, yeah. And then shoot, almost you know, 10 years after that, you know, I made my, clawed my way up to the CMO role, which I spent the last three and a half, four years in. And um, yeah, a, a wild ride. I'm still unpacking that 10 year period. I was just thinking yeah. about it. You know, I left in, in 2020 and I, I still, uh, you know, things that I think some people would consider highlights of, of their career, of people they've met or places they've gone. I, there's still so much I've forgotten that I, I'm still unpacking. It was just a real wild time. Because they were just in, involved with so many different sports and different areas and events and athletes. And yeah. like you said, with, with that hockey stick, uh, when, when did you kind of see that? Was that when you were still with them at the agency or had you come, have you, were you on board then? It was, yeah, it was probably employee. right as the hockey stick started to kick a little bit. You know, there were some massive media things that happened. There were the miners in Chile that, that they sent the GoPros down to see. I don't know if you remember that. I think that was yeah. uh, maybe 2010 ish, uh, give or take a year. And there was just a couple of mass media things that happened that, really started getting GoPro on the map. And I always said that the camera was kind of like the Nike swoosh GoPro had in the camera itself. It was very recognizable. When you saw the camera, you immediately knew it was a GoPro. So th there were some, some big things like that. And, and, you know, once we kind of got over the hurdle of convincing athletes to put it on their heads, because, you know, early days, they did not want to put on their heads. You know, it was called the Teletubby because it was this ugly thing that stuck off the top of their helmets. But once they saw the content that came out of it, you could see this this mind shift of yeah. holy shit! I can't believe I just caught that on camera from that perspective, and and we were just starting to get that adoption in in you know late 2010, 2011. I joined in 2011 and um, joined alongside Justin Wilkenfeld, who was one of Nick's uh, longtime high school buddy or sorry college buddies, and and was I think number three in the company. So yeah, we had kind of carte blanche to go out and and build something from scratch and, and build relationships. And as you know, each audience grew and we we're looking for what's that next audience, what's that next natural application for our cameras. It kind of just, you know, it went from action sports to traditional sports, to lifestyle marketing, to the prosumer market where we're, you know, working with Michael Bay and George Lucas and really convincing them to leverage our, our technology in new ways that they, you know, wouldn't feel comfortable using hundred thousand dollar cameras. And, um, yeah, it just, it just kind of snowballed. We went through our IPO and that played a big role in just brand acknowledgement and understanding and awareness. And I mean, the, we, we became this kind of phenomenon that hard to articulate sometimes because you could, if you walk through an airport or you walk through a crowd with a GoPro hat or a jacket on, you get stopped every single time. It was just like yeah. this, everybody wanted a piece of of gopro and i mean it got us out of a lot of crazy jams and it opened up a ton of unique opportunities for us just having that logo on us and it happened to lots of employees the things that that happened because there was just such a, a energy around the brand so yeah i could talk about that for for hours so i'll and, I'll and what would you say i mean kind of going through all those stages from early on to ipo i mean what were some of the like the major kind of challenges or hurdles yeah i think Really, the challenges started happening probably post IPO. And as great as an IPO is, it it also you know um, demands to operate a business in a completely different way. And there was a lot of learning that went along with that. And now all of a sudden you have shareholders. Um, so you're how do you bring more value to shareholders? So looking for new revenue streams and um, you know, we we took a couple big bets doing that. You know, we decided to get out of our comfort zone of cameras and go after the drone market, you know, spoiler alert that everybody knows we weren't made to be a drone company. We're made to, we're the camera that goes on a drone and, and, you know, it took a lot of time and money and people to figure that out. We also were, we're at a point where we were, had mil millions and millions of units that were capturing content on our cameras that we thought, well, maybe we can monetize this and turn this into a media company. And we went heavy into that. I mean, we made massive hires, um, out of LA, out of New York, major media executives to come in and build long form content. Um, but the, the, the timing just, it, 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 it didn't work. We, we were, we we're almost at odds with each other because as a marketer, you know, on the, on the camera side, you want your, your content to go viral. You don't care where it is or how it goes viral, but you want as many eyeballs to see that content as, 
as possible. And, and you're not really thinking about paying for the content or how much you're going to monetize the content. The content is really what's driving awareness, ultimately conversion of your cameras. Where when you have a media hat on, it's the opposite in a sense, right? It's like, how much money can I make for this content? Who can I sell the rights to this content? And it, so at some point we had to make a decision. Are we a content company or are we a hardware company? And while the hardware ultimately enables the content, at the end of the day, we're still a hardware company. And that, you know, that was a um, hard decision and a hard lesson to learn. But I think it allowed us to kind of come back to center and really understand who we were as a company, who our audience was, who our cameras were made for, uh, and really double down on that, um, which allowed us to get kind of some consistency back and, and level off a lot of the you know, uh, massive inconsistencies and ups and downs that, that everyone I think was seen from our brand for a few years. Yeah. And then was that kind of just then really honing in on those, on those categories, on, on those sports and yeah, like you said, kind of defining what that audience or what the audiences were, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the active lifestyle consumer, right. So as much as it was a lot of these sports, it was also travel. I mean, travel, was you know probably one of our biggest verticals of people traveling so how do you really target people who are traveling and not be so inspirational that you're exclusive and you know i can't i can't count how many times people would say well i don't jump off cliffs on my skis so gopros aren't made for me so we had to kind of figure out how can we taper that down and keep that authenticity and not um forget who we are and where we came from but also create conversations and likability with a new audience that yep. sees applications for them. Right. And that might be a more toned down uh, travel story or, or um, yeah, I mean, travel was a big one for us. And then like, since like with the last couple of years, since you sort of left GoPro and um, yeah, how, where did the idea come from for, for this new venture and, how did that all begin? Yeah, it was interesting. You know, I left I left GoPro in 2020 and uh, d- wanted to take some time off and just breathe. And like I said, I'm still unpacking that that decade of my life. But um, a, a longtime friend and and colleague he actually worked for me at GoPro, running brand. Um, but I've known him for 20 years. Named Joe Dunnigan. He started his career in sports betting decades ago, and he started bugging me in, in probably 2021 saying, Hey, I don't understand why we can't bet on all these sports that we built our careers on and we've built audiences around and we've raised our families around and you can't bet on them. There's got, there's an opportunity. And I, I, I wrote them off for probably six months. I'm like, ah, I don't know if it hasn't been done, there's gotta be a reason. And he was just, he was very passionate, very diligent about it. And he started sending me these numbers and, and the one that got me was they wagered $60 million on ping pong in the state of Colorado in 2020. And that, that was kind of this, wow. holy shit, they're betting that much money on ping pong in one state in one year. And granted there was, there was a pandemic in there. So there was a, a bit of a variable, but at the same time it showed that this, the sports betting market is just growing at a massive, massive, pace um you know 20 percent a year for the next 10 years and there's there's just a, a gap right now you have all the major sports books if you think of FanDuel and DraftKings and Caesars and BetMGM in the in the U.S. that are focused on the big five the big six sports and they're fighting over those customers and they need to diversify and they need to find more effective and efficient ways to acquire new customers and that's what we was saw. there any was there any reason do you reckon why why they didn't like th- those sports went on the radar? Were, were they were they too small for them or they were, were they like okay we'll we'll focus on the five big ones and they were you're exactly right they were too small um, you know they're they're spending tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars on these rights deals with NFL and MLB and NBA and they're they're just hyper focused on on maximizing those investments in those sports and it just yeah. left this this gap. And I think as it relates, especially to action sports and, and even broader alternative sports, there just wasn't, there wasn't anybody that came from within that world that had made the connection with, with the sports betting world. And, and we, we saw it and we saw the gap and, and we went out and did a bunch of due diligence 
in the sports betting world with people Joe knew and on my side with people from the action sports world of, Hey, what do you think of this? Is this, a, is this a crazy idea? And it was a unanimous, Holy shit. We, we need this and it's time for something like this to happen. So yeah, it was really late, late 20, we're in t- late 2021 that we decided to start alt sports data and really in, at its core was let's go partner with leagues within alternative sports, uh, starting with action sports and enable them through the curation formation of their data to create odds and offer them to sports books. So, so the masses can actually bet on them officially, um, in regulated environments. So our first, um, our first league, first entity we signed was thrill one, which is street league nitro rally cross. Obviously they own nitro circus and they, they got it immediately. And, and, and since then we've signed, we've just signed world surf league, which we haven't even announced yet. Maybe when this comes out, it'll be announced, but uh, nice. in the last day we've officially signed world surf league. Congrats. Um, yeah. Thanks. It's, that was, it's funny because world surf league was the first name we put up on our whiteboard of, of, of entities we wanted to go after. And uh, so it's exciting to get that one over the line. And we have, did you look yeah. at fantasy league? Was What's that, that sort of something with the, with this with the WSL with their fantasy league? Did you look at that before? Yeah. Oh, funny kind of- enough, our, our head of product, who coincidentally his name is Michael Jordan, um, he uh, he built and sold a fantasy program to World Surf League and ran yeah. it for them for three or four years. So he um, he came. He was this, this unicorn who loved surfing and documented every surf contest back to like nineteen seventy something and created dynamic data feeds uh, and sold two companies, one to World Surf League and, and one to an Australian company. So he was this guy that, that Joe found on LinkedIn um, that really understood what we were trying to do. And we were able to take yeah. his simulation models and iterate on them to, to focus on other, other sports, whether it's surfing or skateboarding or motorsports or supercross and um, all these other sports with the, within our space. So. We're, we iterated on his model, start bringing in traders and a trading platform. So we provide fully managed trading services to sports books, which means we create the markets and the lines, and then we manage the lines as an event's unfolding. So as heats happen mm-hmm. and the odds change, we're, we're live watching or, or having data fed to our API to, to manage that and adjust those lines accordingly. So there's, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that, that goes on with it, but yeah. You know the 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 leagues are excited because it, again it's new revenue streams, it's new fans, it's new engagement, and um, ultimately that brings new revenue to the athletes and the leagues and and everybody involved. So yeah, it's exciting. Um, and what are the kind of hurdles with getting that set up with the different sports? Is that well, just sort of the league or it's, yeah, it's education and them understanding the space that that they're they're about to embark on and there's it's a heavily regulated environment so there's there's a there's a lot of due diligence that needs to be done and and these sports need to be approved on a state by state basis to be bet on so we go through that whole process um but i think once we get them comfortable with it and we've been fortunate to bring people in our company that come from the sports betting background and are experts in that space so we can kind of help them through that entire process and and really be a partner to them the other interesting part to it is as I meant, kind of our, our main pillar was creating these odds and, and data. The second part, which just as marketers came natural to us as well, if, and if we use surfing as an example, that if you can now bet on the WSL on FanDuel or on DraftKings, why wouldn't we help educate and, and make the surf community aware that you can now do it? Because we think we, you can't just put the sports up on a sports book and expect them to perform, but we also help help the leagues drive their audiences and monetize the audiences by bringing them to the sports books. So it's, yeah. we're also bringing this extended marketing arm, which is very unique in, in the sports betting space of, as a data company that we're not only getting access to the event data, but we're also getting access to customer data. And we are then leveraging that data to drive people through the funnel and ultimately get them to bet on, on the sports they're passionate about. And from the research and um the conversations that you've been having, I mean, what sports or, or what leagues do you kind of see? Like, is there any key focuses at the moment? And then sort of going forwards, have you guys got a sort of plan of? Yeah. I mean, 
we're looking at, at sports across, whether it's action sports, motor sports, endurance sports, and you can think of all the major entities that make up um, all the sports that fit into that. There's, there's dozens, if not hundreds of different disciplines of sport. Um, mm -hmm. But we, um, yeah, we, it's a good question because ask the question again. Sorry, I forgot what you're <laughs> That's all right. Oh, that so, so if there's any sort of key focus on a particular sport yeah, or, sorry, or leagues, sorry. or yeah, if yeah. it's kind of like, if it's looking at, at all of them as a whole, as sort of the, these sports have been maybe underrepresented within this space and yeah, yeah they're almost kind no, of right. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's, it's kind of, at the moment. It depends on the sport because some sports have volume where there's lots yeah. of events. Other sports have just massively engaged audiences. And of course you got to look at those audiences and you know, the audience obviously need to be of legal age or a portion of the audience need to be of legal age and in sports betting friendly states. Um, but we, we kind of look at different filters and, and we've, we've opened up this, this opportunity where now we're getting approached by three or four leagues a week um, that, that are looking to get into sports betting. And there just isn't anybody in the space that's doing what we're doing. There's two major brands in the space are Sport Radar and Genius that, that are, you know, billion dollar publicly traded companies. And similar to the sports books, they're focused on big sports with massive betting handle behind them. And they just don't have the time to go and, and work with these smaller sports. So we've yeah. kind of uncovered this gap um, and it's, it forced us to look, how can we efficiently bring these sports into the platform and make them bettable, uh, and grow with them as, as it matures and as the betting handle continues to grow. And we know early days, some of these sports won't represent a ton of betting handle, but we do think we can drive a lot of audience. And we think there's a lot of new customers that we can bring into, um, you know, that maybe aren't as interested in traditional sports as, as they are in the sports that they're, A, they participate in and they're consuming and engaging with every day so yeah and you were saying like with with ping pong i mean there's like it was 60 million right that the people were betting on that i mean what kind of valuations do you see on some of the the these alternative or like the, of these action sports whether it's board sports yeah. moto obviously yeah, it's I mean, different depending on you know audience numbers but the yeah. audience numbers should then increase right from, from you that. would think i mean i i look at supercross that fills you know 40 to 60,000 person stadiums every weekend for five and a half months of the year um, that I think has mass. I think surfing is so aspirational um, and, and everybody feel, wants to touch and feel surfing on some level and drives uh, so many different parts of culture. I, I think surfing is, is a great opportunity and it's global, which is, is massive and, and has different time zones and helps to create shoulder programming within yeah. sports books when, so they're not always competing with NFL or MLB or NBA. So I think that's really interesting, but some of it's really speculative. I mean, we have, we have ideas on some of them that, that are kind of out there sports that you wouldn't necessarily think of that could end up being sleepers. And we have one called world chase tag, which is funny how mm -hmm. many people actually watched. Um, and these guys are genius where they went out and curated these parkour athletes from all around the world that have massive followings and they put them in this course and they chase each other. And I don't know if you've seen, everyone seems to have seen it on ESPN, but I've they're, seen it, yeah. yeah, they're 20 second chases. So there's just a new betting opportunity every 20 seconds. And it's this person's going to win or this person's going to win. Right. So it's almost yeah. like roulette, black or red. And um, so there's, there's things like that, that just because of the volume and the engagement, there's, there's potentially real big upside on the betting, but I think we'll, we'll see over time, which ones elevate from the rest and, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're excited because there's no lack of, uh, league opportunities behind us. So, yeah. And it, have there been some bigger companies within the space knocking on your door as well? I mean, kind of, yeah, you know. I mean, so DraftKings is, is putting our lines up and we're working with DraftKings fairly closely and we're really close to closing a couple other big deals with big, uh, sports books in, in the U S and in other parts of the world. So, um, we we're we're right there on the on the bubble that we think it's it's really going to blow wide open and and I think World Surf Leagues <clears throat> just because of the credibility they have and the respect that they have um, is going to be a big a big change agent in 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 the energy around this so we're mm -hmm. really excited about um, moving forward with World Surf League which should be um, I don't think we're going to hit 
Portugal because it's tomorrow. I think it starts, but yeah. I think, uh, <laughs> by the next event, early April, we should be up and running and have have odds up on on DraftKings. Nice, and then Street League, uh, Nitro Rally Cross. Nitro Rally Cross, one. yeah, they're they're last. They've been we've been putting Nitro Rally Cross odds up on DraftKings. Uh, their their last event is in two weeks, and then Street League coming uh, end of April for their first event. Uh, I think that's going to be a massive one too. And why, while it's a condensed event in a short time span, I think there's there's a massive audience around it. Obviously, not only in North America but but globally. So we yeah we think that'll create a lot of neat betting opportunities as well. Nice one. Well. Um, and yeah. if people want to find out a bit more, or or if they want to reach out to you, how, what's the best way? Yeah, Alt, Alt Sports Data is is our website. It's, it, it's spelled how it sounds, and and LinkedIn's always a great place to get hold of me. I check that fairly regularly. So Todd Ballard on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, either of those two platforms are probably probably the best. Cool. Thanks, Todd. Uh, well, yes, yeah, super exciting, and to see you yeah. know where it's all going to go. Um, yeah, the uptake from it from all these different sports. Yeah, no, we hope. We hope, like I said, ultimately we want to we want to elevate these sports on on the level we think they should be on um, amongst other traditional stick and ball sports, and um, we think allowing sports betting is a, a catalyst and allowing that to happen. So, yeah, we're excited.